Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past is one of the most influential novels in Western literature. And William Carter's recent biography, Marcel Proust, A Life, is a remarkably vivid and thorough account of the gifted and peculiar Parisian novelist. Carter, a professor of French literature at UAB, contends that Proust lived during one of the most interesting times in the modern world, and that Proust sought to understand one of the most difficult subjects humans face, memory and the passing of time. Who was Marcel Proust in the, in the most general terms, the when and where of Proust? All right. Uh, Proust was born in 1871, and he died in 1922. He lived for 50 years, but he lived during one of the most exciting periods in French history and, and European history. His life encompassed the uh, fin de siècle, the Belle Epoque, uh, and World War I years. And all of this period is brought to life in a very vivid way in his novel. This is the period that we, that we associate most directly with French painting. This mm -hmm. is the period of Impressionism, post-Impressionism. Cubism. Cubism, Cubism. early, early mm -hmm. modernist painting. Correct. The most exciting intellectual period maybe in French history. Tremendously uh, stimulating, and Proust was, Proust was very much part of it. He was very much a, a man of his time. And one of the things that he does in A la recherche du temps perdu, uh, remembrance of things past, or the new English title now is In Search of Lost Time, is he really shows how much society and the way people lived and the way they perceived time and space changed during that period. Yes. All right, what, what happens <laughs> at a meeting of the Proust Club? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's like a lot of the other literary societies. There's a Jane Austen Society, which mm -hmm. is very... Uh, popular and has mm -hmm. large membership in, in this country and abroad. People get together and there are usually uh, talks, lectures organized around a theme uh, having to do with a the novel. Uh, there may be pilgrimages. If you're in France, you go to places that Proust lived in and, and wrote about, uh, films, uh, panel discussions, uh, luncheons, of <laughs> course, dinners. Uh, people have a good time. I'll bet the food is great at the Proust's food is luncheons. Great. <laughs> yes, in France, certainly that is the truth. And Proust. is this global? Is Proust someone who Yes, it, it really is. Over? It, it's an astounding story, I think. That's why we continue to have such a great interest in all of these various adaptations. Uh, I've lost count now, but we're approaching 40-something different languages since the novel was published that it has been translated into. And Proust has never been out of print, which is another sign, I think, of the enduring po popularity of his work. He's not one of those authors that's been kept alive by the Academy. Uh, Proust courses at universities are extremely rare. Proust himself came, he is, a, he is the quintessential Parisian. I mean, yes, his, I think that's a fair statement. I mean, he lived there almost mm -hmm. all the time, except mm -hmm. when he was on holiday and a few weeks in the summer here, the seashore or mm -hmm. the mountains. But it seems to me he was really <coughs> urban, urbane, rooted, and also rooted in a, in a fairly distinguished family. I, th I think it would be fun to hear a few words about his father. His father was quite a fellow. His father was a remarkable figure, and I think until Proust published his novel, uh, everyone would have bet that Adrien, Dr. Adrien Proust would be the famous uh, member of the family, and rightly so. And he does; st he is still remembered indeed. Uh, he is generally credited with having stopped the cholera epidemics that used to sweep through Europe, and he had a position in the government that was not unlike our Surgeon General, mm -hmm. and he had studied the idea of how diseases are spread, uh, mainly from India through Egypt and on into Europe, and he is the one who put in place the cordon sanitaire, which amounted to quarantining uh, ships that were coming in. And a lot of his work actually led to the foundation of the World Health Organization, so he's definitely mm -hmm. a figure who merits mention. And a very vigorous guy, apparently went on scientific field trips deep into Asia, deep into Eastern, uh, well, as far as Siberia? Mm -hmm. up, up. Well, he went to as far as Moscow, and then he came down into what was in Persia mm -hmm. and looped back mm -hmm. through the uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, or the uh, North African countries, back to, to France. And followed the route that the cholera exactly, would take. Exactly, exactly. That's what, what he was, was doing, was tracing how, how to stop it. A lot of people feel, you know, the, the title of Proust's novel, A la recherche du temps perdu, uh, recherche really means research in, as well as search in French. There's no difference between the two words. And 
in search of lost time, uh, what Proust does in that in the novel is really an acti an active exploration of all of everything that it means to be human, and it's done in a very it's carried out with a scientific mm -hmm. rigor in in in, 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 a, in a sense. And many people feel that that perhaps this is partly the father's influence mm -hmm. that he was, as you said, such an energetic and devoted and hardworking man. Well, we can say, after looking at the seven <laughs> volumes, <laughs> that he was thorough. He was thorough. If that he was a lab report on the human condition yes. during 40 years of French history, it is a thorough report. It was. Indeed, you know, uh, Northrop Fry in the Anatomy of Criticism uh, classifies Proust as an encyclopedic author, mm -hmm. along with James Joyce. Mm -hmm. And of course, that sounds like a dreadful label to put on a novel, encyclopedic. <laughs> but it's really wonderful, because there's no aspect of what it is to be alive uh, through all of the emotions, psychology, perception, ambition, disappointments, uh, the, the entire gamut of the human experience is, is brought vividly to life in Proust. But Proust was one weird guy. <laughs> now, <laughs> you spent, I know, decades studying Proust, but you do agree that he was a very eccentric man. He was indeed, and I think this is part of the appeal. I mentioned earlier why he's cited so often, I think, as the epitome of, of the writer and a person who has sacrificed his life to, to his vocation, to his literary vocation. He indeed was that. Uh, one of his friends said that Proust had such a bizarre regimen. He basically slept all day and wrote all night. And there are other things about that, that that we can mention. But that he organized his life to write this particular book. And so it's a little bit zany, perhaps. Uh, it's certainly eccentric. Uh, but it, there's also something about the way he produced the book and the content of the book that I think is very much influenced by the life that he, he led. The, the man who painted his uh, famous portrait that's yes. on the cover of my book, uh, who was uh, a well-known painter but also not a bad literary critic, said that the novel is about insomnia. That's one of those very short <laughs> descriptions of An of encyclopedic <laughs> novel about, <laughs> about insomnia. insomnia. About insomnia, yes. Proust slept all day. When he went out at all, he went out usually late, late at night. That is correct. His yeah. eating habits, not only his sleeping habits, but his eating habits were bizarre. Yes, for a man who, be, who came from a distinguished medical family, as we were just discussing, he very early on, he had asthma, the onset of asthma, severe asthma, when he was about 10 years old. And he very early on lost faith in doctors and medical science uh, to help him. And so he adopted a regimen of uh, sleep and eating uh, that was strange but also self-medication. Often he would eat one large meal a day after, you know, in the middle of the night when everybody else was uh, sleeping, or towards the end of his life, he pretty much lived on, on caffeine or maybe a little milk, maybe a croissant. He loved, you mentioned the Ritz earlier, the Ritz Hotel in Paris, he loved iced beer from the Ritz. That was one of his, the only, things he cons only thing he consumed in his last days. <laughs> His, his large meals, which you described, right. are monstrous. Well, in the beginning, they would be. Sometimes they would be, and then he got to the point where he would eat very little. Uh, he, w he, at one point, became anorexic. At one point, he put on a lot of weight. Uh, but I think the main, the main dangers to his health uh, were th was the excessive um, consumption of coffee or caffeine tablets to wake up and get himself going, Both? and then sleeping pills uh, to go to sleep. Uh. Because he was a very high-strung, very uh, sensitive, hypersensitive to, to sound, to smell. He had germ phobia towards the end of his life. And yeah. so all of this. The hypersensitivity, I mean, we would be remiss not <laughs> to bring up his special room. Yes. He was so sensitive to sound that he did what? Well, he had his entire bedroom where he, he wrote in bed and the ceiling lined with cork. And this, of course, became the famous cork-lined room. I should say, for the safe, uh, sake of accuracy or perhaps historical interest, uh, that this was not Proust's original idea. There were actually two other writer friends that he knew who had done the same thing. Uh, Anna de Noailles, a playwright by the name of uh, Henri Bernstein, 
But Paris was a very noisy place. It was a very noisy place at that time because you had all of the immense traffic, the new automobiles, uh, the street cars, and even the old horse and carriages on those cobblestones. And of course, if you're trying to sleep during the daytime, then you do need some uh, insulation. But Proust, it's because of his fame, it's his cork line roof yes. that everybody uh, imagines and pictures. Oh, it is. If, if right. The connection between right. the cork lined room and right. Marcel Proust but, is uh, absolutely. In the novel, the narrator, who is not really Proust, but there are some similarities, uh, claims to be able to tell exactly what the weather is like, whether the sun is shining or not. With all the, the drapes were always closed. This is true. In Proust's own room, he, the windows and the drapes were never open. So he did live in this sort of hermetically sealed uh, in environment, which is uh, sort of like a dark room where he develops all of his <laughs> exposed film. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> he's, he's got asthma. He has a very strange daily schedule. His eating habits are odd, he, as, as we can explore in some other small way. He's probably homosexual. Mm -hmm. And he goes into the, into the French army and has in the French army a, an ama well, as you, as you tell the story, a very successful enlistment. Yes. How, how, do you, how do you, I mean, you must have, have wrestled with, with that particular little conundrum. How does this fellow manage to fit in so well in the, in the French infantry? And, and yes. like it, and like it. Yes. Well, he was stationed in Orléans, which was about an hour or so away from Paris. He had uh, leave pretty much every weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, his, he originally moved into the barracks, but his asthma and his coughing fits kept the other soldiers awake at night, so he was given special permission to move into a private apartment near the barracks. And as was typical of the time, Proust came from a very wealthy, prominent family. He hired people to shine his boots and to do things like that. But even so, um, he was surprised. I think all of his friends and his family were surprised. He seemed to fit in so well. He enjoyed the camaraderie of the uh, other men and, and the common soldiers. He particularly admired them. And this comes out uh, in the World War I episode in, in, in the novel. I think it's partly due to the fact that he was away from home uh, and, and he could enjoy some independence and he probably, he was very young, he was only 19 at the time, 18 or 19, so he, he was enjoying a relatively good period of health. But he finished 63rd out of 64 in his class and he wanted to re-enlist but the army said no thank you very much. <laughs> he was second from the bottom. <laughs> second from well, the bottom. <laughs> he was not a great soldier. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he loved military strategy, and there's a lot about World War I and uh -huh. military strategy in, uh -huh. in the novel. In spite of being an odd man, and clearly a difficult man, his servants loved him. There was a devotion in um, the woman who was with him for so long. Celeste Albarré. Celeste, and, and others. People, people um, put up with or were devoted to Marcel Proust. Um, again, what, what did you, to what did you attribute that? I think Proust was an, an incredibly generous and kind person most of the time, and he took an interest in everyone. I think this is one of the, the signs of intelligence and, and certainly of genius, is someone who is tremendously curious and wants to know and cares. And a lot of the material that went into the book, I mentioned the investigations that he did and mm -hmm, carried out, mm -hmm. he, he would talk to anyone and everyone. He spent hours uh, talking to waiters, to concierge, to servants. He loved gossip, and he loved to find out. And if you think about it, uh, this is basically the sort of, uh, these are the surveys, the polls as we now call them, a lot of what Proust wrote about sexuality in the novel, and that is indeed one of the pioneering aspects of it, came from his intensive questioning and investigation and, and, and gathering gossip from many people. And what was interesting to me is when the first Kinsey report came out, I think it was in 1937, on human sexuality, a lot of what Proust says in the novel about human sexual behavior and even some of the statistics that he gave were pretty much confirmed by Kinsey. So it's really the same sort of thing. Kinsey's passing out his questionnaire, his questionnaires, and Proust is over here interviewing everybody he can. <laughs> interviewing and all the waiters. Interviewing all the waiters, exactly, exactly. 
his relationship to other people, I mean, he, he obviously had a need for a certain amount of human contact, whether it was uh, Celeste or um, What's the chauffeur's name? Agostinelli. Agostinelli. Mm -hmm. And yet, as time passed, apparently his, his phobia prevented him from any kind of human contact. Yes. Is, this, um, is this, these things working at odds with one another? No, I think what Proust liked to do, his theory about the, the artist or the creative person, because when Proust talks about the artist, he also means scientist. Einstein would be... Uh, Proust's mm -hmm. idea of, of, of an artist. Uh, he liked to come back at late at night or early in the morning for Proust, or on our time it would be early in the morning, having been out to a party, having observed people, having questioned people, queried them, as I mentioned earlier. And he would often call Celeste in, or she would be waiting for him, and then she would come in the bedroom and stand, and he would relate to her uh, what he had seen that evening and tell the anecdotes and the stories. And then often, then when he would be alone, all by himself writing, then he would transpose these in, into fiction. And so I think he, he liked to have people around him at certain times, both to provide him with information or to serve as a sounding board, a sort of recording device. If I tell Celeste all of this, it will help me not only to remember it, but to select the bits and pieces that I then want to work on and work into the the story that I'm, I'm telling. Celeste, uh, not in an absolute sense, but in a, I, I think arguably, takes the place of Proust's mother. His relationship to his mother was extraordinary. And you spend quite a lot of time on, on that relationship. It, it, do you admire it? Do you think it was healthy? Do you, is, is it a relationship we should applaud? It certainly was intense. I think that uh, Proust parents were in a, a difficult position, as parents often are, because uh, he, he was a very nervous, uh, extremely sensitive, and sick child. And so uh, I think the mother, his mother, tried to find the ideal line between being too loving and too understanding and too doting. And, and making him uh, free and, and independent and self-sufficient. And I think sometimes uh, she failed, and, and we can sympathize with that by perhaps being too doting, by paying him too much attention. But the relation was uh, extremely close and extremely intimate, and clearly he loved her more than anyone in, in his life. And he used to, even uh, when they were in the same house together, uh, they would write each other little notes and letters, and, and he would always confide in her and, and so forth. And as he became ill, or even when he was an adolescent, um, he became uh, sick. Uh, he would write to her every day all of his bodily functions, yes. whether you know he went to the bathroom, what sort of bowel movement he had, and so forth. And so I think there was uh, an, uh, an intense dependency on the mother. And at the same time, he resented uh, the control. But I think also, Proust is a typical child in many ways, and that children usually do rebel at some point against parental authority. And so in his case, this would, these would be outbursts of anger uh, that don't seem to be justified. She, on the other hand, at moments when he seemed, for example, when he went to uh, his military service and he seemed to be more independent and to be moving away, she would chide him if, if she did not get the daily letter. And so one feels that maybe there were some missed opportunities on her part to sort of push him out of the family nest, which never happened because after the military service he came back and lived at home and, and was living at home when both his parents died <laughs> and driving everybody crazy pretty much because of his odd schedule, because all the servants and everybody had to <laughs> tiptoe around in the daytime and, and meals could never be served at a regular hour. And so there was, a, there was a lot of conflict during that period about his schedule. They did everything, his parents did everything they could to make him live on a normal schedule and also controlling the money. The family was very wealthy, but they did not approve of his uh, spending so much, his excessive tips, mm -hmm. and they wanted him to have a respectable profession. They wanted him to be a lawyer or a diplomat 
or a doctor, and he did well, earn a number of university degrees. Every parent, that, I was about to ask you about <laughs> that, but every parent who has ever sent a child to college can read your book and just, <laughs> just writhe in empathy. Proust was a university student of several, in several different fields for yes. several years. Yes, he got a law degree, a degree in philosophy, and a degree in literature. And the most he ever worked was a brief stint as a sub-librarian or yes, something. Yes, yes. It was sort of like working in the book depository, you know, shelving books or cataloging books as they arrived. This was pretty much an honorary position. It was competitive. There was a little test you had to take, but it was not uh, a paid position. And uh, Proust apparently only showed up one day for a few hours, and then he went on official leave for five years, which was the Mac, he kept renewing it every year until finally they said, that's it. And even then he tried to get, get it renewed, extended, right. because at least he could claim to have some sort of position. But all during this period, uh, this, these early years after the military service, during his university years, he did begin publishing stories and poems in various uh, literary journals. And he was working on a very ambitious novel uh, that was published posthumously that really no one knew about until 1950, some 30 years after mm -hmm. Proust's death. So he was working hard, but his contemporaries did not know he, that he was working hard. And he had no hard. need to earn money. He really. had no need to earn money, no. And he was going out in, in the most elegant uh, Paris salons, to the theater, to the opera, right. having a grand time, and pursuing uh, the most fashionable society hostesses and men about town. He wanted to belong to that set very much. And uh, his family, again, disapproved of what they thought was wasted time. And of course, this resonates very much in the title of the novel, In Search of Lost Time. Temps perdu in French means both lost time and wasted time. And this becomes a great theme right. in the novel. Along with the cork-lined room, <clears throat> One who does not know much about Proust might know about the scene in the novel with the tea and the cookie. And the Madeleine. The, Madeleine. the famous Madeleine, yes. And this is a this is not just a tea and a cookie. This right. is a philosophical, uh, psychological moment. Can can you Right. Can you explain it? Right. What happens? I, I, I will try to explain it, or at least I will try to give my version of, of this very famous scene. Uh, for those who are interested in reading Swan's Way, by the way, the scene occurs fairly early in, right. in Swan's Way. The uh, narrator, at a particular point in his life, we don't know what time it is, but at a later point in his life is dipping a uh, madeleine into tea, and it's something his aunt used to prepare for him long ago when he was a child, and he has not tasted this in many years. And so when he has this particular sensation of, uh, and smell, taste of the tea and the madeleine, his past comes rushing back to him in what Proust called involuntary memory, which is kind of a spontaneous memory, or it's a, similar to the experience that's sometimes called déjà vu. And so this reminds the narrator of all of the time that has been lost and it also reminds him of how vivid the experience was because it comes back. I mean, he thinks that he, for a moment, there's this flash. And you know in the deja vu, you think you have lived this moment before, or you think you're reliving a moment for the past. This serves primarily as a, a symbol, as a sign, as a kind of epiphany that mainly we go through life and there are various uh, things that detract, that distract us, that make us not live life fully. Uh, this can be habit, uh, which is sort of an anesthesia. Uh, in fact, Proust sort of uh, treats habit like the opposite of art, which is an original, powerful, new vision. And so the Madeleine experience uh, shows him that the past is somehow buried within us but it depends a little bit on chance whether or not we have this vision. But then when he becomes, uh, the story of the narrator is a man in search of his vocation as a writer. Mm -hmm. He has a, at the very end of the novel, in Time Regained, there, is a, there are a series of these involuntary memory expense, uh, experiences. And he sees that the past can be retrieved, but it's not simply a matter 
of remembering it. You have to find it again, you have to understand it, you have to interpret it, and then if you are a writer, you have to transpose it into a work of art so that others can share the same experience and the same vision. So that, in uh, briefly, is, is sort of what the Madeleine experience uh, means. Well, compared to seven volumes, <laughs> that was v very brief indeed. Well, Proust's, Proust's gift was the seven-part novel. Your gift is the study of Proust. He shared his. I'm delighted that you took the ch opportunity to share yours. This has been fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it a great deal, Don. <laughs>